Good morning, um, good afternoon, um, and good evening, everyone, from, from wherever you're joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this panel on, on the meaning of silence in international law. Um, silence represents a paradox in, in life as well as in law. As scholars of rhetoric claim, in silence we speak, but what that speech communicates remains elusive. Silence can link or separate, it can heal or wound, it can reveal or conceal, and it can signal assent as well as dissent. Um, in the sense to, to quote Foucault, there is not one silence, but many silences, and they're an integral part of the strategies um, that underlie and permeate discourses. And to explore the many ways in which silence underlies and permeates the discourse of international law, I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished panelists for today. Uh, we're joined by Dane Azaria, Associate Professor in Public International Law at the University College London, and Director of the ERC State Silence Project, uh, Simon Batifor, partner at Curtis Malay, um, Campbell McLaughlin, uh, Professor of International Law at the Victoria University of Wellington, and Natalie Morris Sharma, uh, the Government Legal Counsel at Singapore Attorney General's Chambers, and our heroic person who still who sort of um, stayed up, or rather got up quite early to be able to join us for this panel. Um, and my name is Neha Jain. Uh, I'm Professor of Public International Law at the European University Institute in Florence, um, and also a Professor at the University of Minnesota. And I'm honored to be moderating this session. Um, so the way we'll conduct the session is, um, is I will start off with a series of questions for our distinguished panelists, and then we will leave about um, 30 minutes for, for questions from the audience. So please um, have your finger on the chat button, um, and I will monitor the questions as they come so that we can post them to our panelists. Uh, but perhaps we start with, uh, with the most basic, yet the most difficult question to answer which is um, what the silence or rather the many silences mean in international law? Uh, what function do they serve? Do they actually mean the same thing in, in the different subfields of international law or, or do, do the different stakeholders in international law understand and, and interpret silence differently? Um, so a whole series of questions or rather one big question depending on how you look at it. Um, perhaps we can, um, I can start with you Campbell. Thanks so much, Neha, and it's really a delight to be able to join uh, with all of you uh, from uh, my home in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, I suppose uh, when I first started thinking about this topic, um, I could have been described as a little bit of a silence skeptic. Um, I'm wary of reading in too much into what uh, states in particular don't say, uh, as the International Court itself is somewhat confirmed in its judgment of just last week in the Somalia and Kenya case. And I think Simon's going to speak a little bit more about that in the investment law context as well. I'm also a little was a little bit skeptical because in the world that I'm studying in the book that I'm writing on systemic integration, I see a world thickly populated by the concrete acts and statements of states in treaties and in state conduct, uh, in customary international law and in the positions that they take before international courts and tribunals. And the real challenge that I see is how to make sense of all of that. That's, that. That is the challenge, if you like, of systemic integration, a nice principle to propound, but more difficult to apply. Uh, not least because not all of the acts and conducts of states can or can possibly be consistent. Uh, and even when they're embodied in, treat in treaties, uh, there's the possibility of different ob ob objectives and obligations having been assumed by states, which is to some extent intention. But of course, we do know that silence can produce concrete consequences in international law. We've known that for a long time in the field of uh, boundary delimitation. Uh, but, we've all, but we've also been reminded of it by the ILC in the development of customary international law uh, in one of its conclusions uh, on in that field where uh, the commission accepted that in certain circumstances, silence could play a role. But here there's a real issue, isn't there? Because customary international law as a whole has come under a degree of suspicion uh, as being a law imposed on states without their express consent. And I suppose silence there is particularly at risk, isn't it? Because the idea that you can be subject to legal uh, normative obligations uh, without saying anything uh, is a challenge. <clears throat> 
But saying that, I've been educated about the significance of silence, not least by my, my uh, colleague, Danai Atsaria, whom you're going to hear from, since I had the privilege of uh, seeing the early uh, generation of her uh, big project on silence, but also uh, with some very interesting research undertaken uh, by a, a PhD scholar working under my supervision, Osvaldo Urrutia, who in his day job was also the uh, chair of the Regional Fisheries Management Organization in the South Pacific. And I'm going to use that example with his uh, permission and blessing uh, because I think it helps to explain why silence might nevertheless still be important in a world dominated by treaties uh, because it helps us to respond to the challenge imposed by the classic challenge, if you like, imposed by the, the tension between stability and the need for change. So the example here is the problem of unregulated fishing on the high seas. On the one hand, you have in the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, a uh, Article 116 of freedom to fish and a rather weaker, if I may say so, a concomitant duty to cooperate. But states' abilities to concretize the cooperation obligation in hard edge regional fisheries management schemes has always been limited by the classic problem of all treaties, which is how do you impose those obligations on states that haven't chosen to become a party to them. Uh, what uh, practice, nevertheless, though, shows under uh, the work across many regional fisheries management organizations is, a is an increasing practice where the organization asserts a right to exclude vessels flagged to non-member states who, in response, say nothing, but nevertheless, the vessels do not return or they're reflagged from the state or delisted, I should say, from the, uh, from the registry. Well, what's the consequence of that kind of silence in international law? Well, in the first place, I think it tends to create a bilateral set of obligations between the two states. It creates a relationship of opposability created by acquiescence or is capable of doing so. But note here that the silence, we, what we don't have is silence on its own. We have a positive assertion of a legal entitlement on the part of the organization and its members, and then a response, which includes actually a contract, a, a, a conscious act, a delisting of the vessel, uh, or probably an instruction which, which is not published uh, not to uh, fish in the relevant area. We might, if those bilateral relationships of opposability begin to stack up, see the emergence of a new customary rule. And here custom, I think, can play quite a, a valuable function. It's a form, if you like, of constrained dynamism founded on the actions and reactions of states that can help to rebalance obligations which are now concreted into major multilateral treaties, but, may, but which may in fact be failing to keep up with the real challenges which we're facing in the world today. The unmitigated freedom to fish in the high seas and the law of the sea convention is just one example, I think, of a, of a rule which might have seemed quite sound when it was framed, but where international practice has most definitely moved on in favor of environmental considerations. And I think therefore that what we see then in which silence can play an important part is something which more a picture of international law and the way in which it works to regulate states that more accurately reflects the decentralized nature um, of contemporary international society regulated by international law. Thanks, Nia. That's actually really interesting. And you focused in some way on the gaps in, treaty, in treaties that then result in states using customary international law and this constrained dynamism, as you put it, to actually move forward in a, in a scenario where there are gaps in treaties. Um, so this, you know, this brings up an interesting question about um, what happens during the treaty, during the treaty drafting and negotiation process in some ways, and how does silence occur there and what's at state, uh, what's at stake for states there that then states are forced or compelled or want to move on to, to custom as a way of um, negotiating between stability and dynamism in international law. Um, perhaps Natalie, with your experience, you, you would be the perfect person to answer that. 
Thanks very much, Neha, and um, really great to be here. Thank you very much for the organizers inviting me to be a part of this panel. And I will, uh, of course, be expressing my personal views. It's good to come right up after Campbell on, on this topic um, and to follow up with the treaty making perspective. I do think that uh, I, I, mean, I, I agree very much with Campbell that silence helps to respond to that tension between stability and change. Silence provides room for agreement. It provides room for the development and the evolution of the law, as you say, you know, uh, whether it may be in the form of customary international law or otherwise. Um, although the tricky, the tricky situation then is how to faithfully determine the intention of the treaty parties, and maybe we can also get into that a little bit later during during the session. But for now, um, I, I thought it would be interesting to kind of delve into your your outline earlier of the many silences um, and draw a little bit out. Uh, from that concept. I think it's very true that uh, silence does very much depend, the meaning of silence very much depends on its factual context and not all silences are capable of producing legal effects. Uh, some may be intentional, some may be unintended. Uh, sometimes this could be informed by the overarching uh, structure of the treaty and issue and then uh, camp that Campbell's reference to the Law of the Sea Convention could be one of them, uh, and, the, and as well as the frameworks of the RFMOs. But from the state perspective, there are really very many reasons why, at least from the treaty making perspective, um, when drafting a treaty, you may end up having an issue um, addressed more in its silence than otherwise. And I thought I might list a few examples uh, of, of that, and then some further examples of how we see that in practice. So some reasons for silence when we when we draft our treaties could be simply that there was a, a sense that there was no need to state the obvious. It could be a willingness to leave the space to be occupied by the principles of general international law or residuary rules, including as they may develop over time. It could be an absence of agreement, an absence of a view, and by this I mean indifferent, anything from indifference to a lack of awareness or a lack of anticipation, for instance, of a new and unforeseen development. And these are some, um, I, I suppose, within the, the legal understanding of when you're, you're drafting a treaty, but there could also be extra legal and political considerations. And of course, to further complicate matters, a treaty may appear to be silent on an issue, but it may be elsewhere, the issue may be elsewhere discussed or recorded, and this is especially so um, for uh, bilateral treaties or plurilateral treaties, as opposed to multilateral ones, where you could have confidential side letters. And of course, in all treaties, uh, you have the travel or the record, records of meeting that uh, uh, complement the treaty contents, but more on the issue of travel later. Um, and I thought it'd be useful to give some examples to illustrate these different instances of silence um, or different intentions that lead to silence that then influence how we interpret its meaning. So one example are the multilateral negotiations at the UN Commission on International Trade Law, UNCTRAL, for the Singapore Convention of Mediation, which I was involved in as the chairperson. And the Singapore Convention is essentially, uh, for those who may not be familiar, the New York Convention for Mediated Settlement Agreements. And in the convention, the definition of mediation provides that there is an involvement of a third party neutral without a authority to impose a solution on the disputing parties. And the question may arise then as to the extent to which this definition enables the Singapore Convention to accommodate hybrid dispute settlement processes such as MEDAB or mediation arbitration. And the short answer is that the convention does accommodate such processes as the definition of mediation um, while silent uh, to the fact that the lack of authority of a third party neutral is at the time of the mediation. Uh, this was because it was seen that as unnecessary to stipulate that additional condition or that additional detail. There was no need to state the obvious. Um, the Singapore Convention also contains examples of the willingness of the negotiators to leave the space to be occupied by the principles of general international law. So for instance, it does not delve into the issue of sovereign immunity as it was generally agreed that it would be for the enforcing authority to decide on such questions on the basis of the applicable rules of state and sovereign immunity. Another example, um, it would be exactly uh, a different aspect of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And uh, so Campbell has spoken about one area. And I've also noted 
um, when 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 working on on the convention and issues related to there too, that it does not provide a definition for marine scientific research. And this is because the negotiators, if we look at the Virginia commentary and other commentaries, the negotiators were unable to reach a consensus on whether, and if so, how to distinguish between pure and fundamental scientific research on the one hand and applied scientific research on the other hand. And this, if you will, blurry relationship between scientific research and bioprospecting has in more recent years become a topic of much discussion in the context of the BBNJ negotiations over the new international legally binding instrument under UNCLOS on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So, of course, these are multilateral treaty negotiations and what I've referred to, there's often a decent record or travel of the negotiations that enable an elucidation of the negotiators' intentions. There are also examples in the UN Convention on Law of the Sea um, uh, and other multilateral conventions where this may not be the case. Um, and, and perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, also something that's come up in the BBNJ context uh, and the status of marine genetic resources. And what is it that's at stake for states? I'd say from the treaty making perspective, understanding um, the commitments undertaken by a state in its exercise of sovereign powers, its rights and its obligations um, what exactly was state did the state consent to? And this then informs implementation efforts, interactions with other treaty partners, and so on. So it's it's a starting point in many senses, uh, but also informs the rest of the process throughout the way up until uh, including the dispute settlement and treaty breaking process, even. Thank you, Neha. That's great. So, so from what it sounds like, Campbell started his life as a silent skeptic. Um, Natalie seems to be a silent pragmatist. And so maybe Danae, since you would be educating, when, according to Campbell, would you, would you be classified as a silent optimist or proselytizer? Like, well, what role do you think um, silence is playing, uh, especially when it comes to states? I think I take a rather uh, neutral role. And um, well, let, let me explain that. Uh, so state silence is a fact. Um, the fact that a state says or does nothing. And as such, says state silence is an ambiguity. It can mean acceptance, it can mean opposition, or it can mean nothing at all. And as um, uh, Natalie just pointed out, there may be um, extra legal reasons for which uh, states remain silent. Um, the state silence project that I lead and which is funded by the European Research Council deals with this ambiguity. It will lead to uh, a book on state silence in international law and an edited volume on, volume on state silence across international law. And I also encourage participants to follow us, uh, follow our events and our research through our website, which will be launched um, next week. I have placed the link on the chat just now. Now, silence is given legal meaning owing to its uh, context. Uh, the law is concerned with what I call reactive state silence, the absence of physical or verbal act um, as a response to or against the background of someone else's conduct or claim. And I would like to make two comments. The first um, is that the role of state silence is ubiquitous in international law. And the second is that the role of state silence is diverse. Um, state silence, as Campbell already pointed out, uh, may contribute to the emergence of an international agreement, including a tacit agreement, but also the emergence of CASTA, but it can constitute also a uni unilateral manifestation of will. It can also be relevant for interpreting treaties, for amending, modifying, or even terminating treaty rules and customary rules. And further, state silence can be relevant in all fields of international law. And by that, I mean all fields of um, primary rules that prescribe the conduct of states from traditional areas of international law, such as boundary delimitation, to community interest areas, such as international environmental law and uh, human rights law. Now, moving on to the diverse um, role uh, of state silence, I focus on boundary delimitation and I would like to use two examples of uh, decisions of the International Court of Justice to contextualize a little bit our discussion. So and more specifically, the Prahi Vihear case and the Somalia versus Kenya case. Now in Temple Vihear, the court considered a dispute between Cambodia and Thailand relating to sovereignty over the Temple of uh, Prahi Vihear. In its judgment of 1962, the court found that the temple was situated on Cambodian uh, territory. 
And the court's reasoning was that the boundary between Siam and Cambodia, Cambodia was at the time uh, France's protectorate, had been agreed by the uh, 1904 France-Siam Treaty. The court considered that the maps that France sent to the Siamese government officials indicating the temple in Cambodia were circumstances that called for Siam's reaction in the absence of which Siam's silence meant acquiescence in 1908 as to the precise delimitation of the boundary. And for the court, this instance was one of subsequent interpretation of this bilateral treaty. Fast forward 60 years later, in Somalia, Kenya, in 20, 2021, a couple of weeks ago, the court was uh, concerned with the delimitation of uh, the territorial sea continental shelf and exclusive economic zone of Somalia and Kenya, which were adjacent uh, states, um, they have adjacent coasts, and are both parties to the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention. Articles 15 and 83 and 74 of this convention provide that if there is no agreement between coastal states, the territorial sea continental shelf and exclusive zones um, respectively are to be delimited on the basis of these articles. Now, Kenya argued that it had fixed the boundaries and that Somalia accepted them by way of acquiescence. Somalia argued that maritime boundaries cannot be delimited by acquiescence, which involves unilateral acts, not an international agreement. And in any event, it was arguing that Somalia did not acquiesce to Kenya's unilateral claims. Now the court did not address Somalia's argument that acquiescence is not an agreement as provided in the Law of the Sea Convention. Rather, it explained that the shared understanding between the parties is a requirement for a tacit agreement and that acquiescence is equivalent to tacit recognition manifested by unilateral conduct. And then it indicated that the threshold for establishing either a tacit agreement or acquiescence are very high and concluded its reasoning by spelling out the conditions of acquiescence, which it examined at length in later paragraphs and more specifically that Kenya's claim had to be held consistently, consi consistently and consequently uh, called for a response from Somalia um, and that Somalia had to clearly and consistently have accepted the boundary claimed by Kenya. So what are the main conclusions that we can draw from boundary uh, delimitation cases um, um, in relation to uh, state silence even within one area of law? I suppose the major um, Conclusion is that the role of state silence is diverse on three levels. First, silence can be relied on for interpreting a written agreement between states, but it can also be creative of legal relationships between states in the absence of a written agreement. In both these instances, the thresholds for silence to produce such an effect uh, are very high. The second point to make is that stability of frontiers plays a central role in this area. However, this, not, this does not always mean that state silence does not have a transformative role. In Somalia, Kenya, the high thresholds of for silence to produce acquiescence and fails stability. And that's because silence does not change the legal relationship between the parties. But in Tempo Vihear, uh, the court expressly considered the stability of frontiers as a reason for safeguarding, um, um, as, as, a, as a goal to be, to, to, to be safeguarded by giving Siam's um, silence a transformative effect. And third, silence as acquiescence is a unilateral act, but silence may, may be seen as, as an element of a bilateral legal act as well, as um, part of an international agreement. The distinction may be difficult to make, and the court has not as yet clarified this distinction or the relationship between the two. And I think that Somalia versus Kenya perhaps can be seen as a missed opportunity for the court to expre expressly clarify these two functions um, of state silence. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a really interesting observation that just about the diverse roles that silence can play, even in one area of international law, um, as you as you've outlined. And of course, you've been speaking mostly about state silence. So there's also that that to consider. And so maybe we move um, a little beyond states, like um, you know, all three all three of you to some extent have focused on states so far. But of course, states are not the only actors in international law. 
silence is also used by adjudicators, by litigants, by, um, by you know, all, all sorts of other stakeholders in international law. So maybe, um, Simon, considering you are one of those stakeholders, maybe, maybe we move to you, um, you know, and what, what's your idea of what role silence is playing when we move beyond states? Thank you very much, uh, Neha. Um, so I'll answer by using uh, the example of how silence is addressed in investment treaty arbitration, which is one of the most active and controversial areas of public international litigation, also happens to be my area of focus. Um, so parties to an investment dispute, you have on one side the claimant investor and on the other side the respondent state, often adopt opposite positions regarding the meaning of silence. Claimants argue that if the contracting states to the investment treaty had meant to include a limitation on the scope of coverage or on the substantive obligations in the treaty, they would and should have said so expressly. Respondent states, on the other hand, often argue that the silence of the treaty should not be read permissively to expand the scope of coverage or the substantive obligations. If the states had intended to be bound by certain obligations, they would have said so expressly. To answer, the answer to these questions can have an enormous impact as this field often involves sensitive questions regarding the contours of the regulatory powers of the state and very large claims for damages. In practice, arbitrators have often adopted a creative approach to silence, in the sense that silence will serve as a justification for expanding the scope of coverage of the treaty and the substantive obligations of treatment. The use of this creative approach can be seen on key issues of jurisdiction, liability, and compensation, resulting in a considerable expansion of the regime of international investment law. I'll briefly mention three examples. The first one is mass claims. In the famous Abaclav v. Argentina case, hundreds of thousands of bondholders decided to bring a single treaty arbitration against Argentina. It was common ground that neither the ICSID convention nor the BAT said anything about such mass claims. And the tribunal recognized in principle that this silence could be a limitation, but it then noted that bonds constituted a protected investment under the treaty, according to its interpretation, and decided that bonds would be better protected if, they, if the claims could proceed through uh, a mass claim proceeding. According to what the tribu tribunal deemed to be the spirit of exit and the purpose of the BIT, it found that mass claims should be permitted in order to provide an effective remedies in connection with such investments and nothing in the treaty said that those remedies weren't available. In other words, the tribunal found, um, relied on the fact that if nothing in the treaty says that we can, this cannot be done, and we think that this helps investors, in particular case, it is permissible. That's the approach for the, but by the, this tribunal. The second example concerns claims of dual nationals. There's a well-known rule of customary international law establishing that dual nationals generally cannot sue their own state of nationality on the international plane, unless it is not their state of dominant and effective nationality. The full chamber of the Iran-US Claims Tribunal recognized this rule relying on Article 313C of the Vienna Convention to read, into the, to read it into the silence of the Algiers uh, Declaration. In investment treaty arbitration, a series of decisions have disregarded the customary international law. Similarly to the reasoning in Abaclat, they reason that since nothing in the investment treaty prohibits claims by dual nationals against their state of nationality, those claims are permitted without limitation. The third example I wanted to evoke concerns exceptions in investment treaties. States more and more frequently include exceptions in investment treaties for measures adopted to protect the environment, human rights, and other kinds of public interests. In the recent Eco Oro v. Colombia case, the state requested that the tribunal dismiss the case on the ground that the disputed measure, measures fell under the exceptions clause, the environmental um, exceptions clause of the treaty. And even though it was not disputed, that the measures fell within the scope 
of the exception clause. The tribunal found that the treaty was, was silent on the issue of whether compensation could be owed for such measures, and, and it dismissed the state's defense. This is arguably an instance of reading silence into a treaty where there is none. I say this because normally a state does not need to specify that no compensation will be due for conduct that does not breach the treaty. That's simply a consequence of the fact that there's no breach in the first place. So we see that in this area of public international law litigation, silence is not infrequently read to create jurisdiction or to impose state responsibility. My view is questionable whether this is consistent with basic principles of international law. Normally, jurisdiction in international law must be expressly conferred, cannot be implied. States are normally not bound by treaty obligations unless they have consented to be bound. Another important principle we've evoked is that relevant rules of international law must be taken into account when interpreting a treaty. As I mentioned, this is expressly provided in the Vienna Convention. Some arbitrators, of course, are respectful of those principles and tend to adopt more cohesive interpretations of investment treaties, which take into account the broader legal environment in which those treaties operate. But others, unfortunately, seem to simply ignore them when interpreting treaty silence. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. So, so if I'm if I would try to, to try and instill sort of a common theme from, from your very, very richly detailed responses in very different areas of international law, um, and from the point of view of different actors, it seems like rather than connoting an, an absence or, or a nothingness, which is what the layperson thinks of when they think of silence, um, in the words of Susan Sontag, uh, silence might instead represent everything that could be said. Um, and the silences you've highlighted um, in international law don't seem to be opposed to language, but rather um, silence and language appear to act in a dialectic fashion to construct and shape international law. And so if that is the case, then, um, then the next question becomes, how should international law, or rather the different actors in international law react uh, when, when they're faced with this silence? Um, and this time perhaps we start at, at sort of the beginning of the process, which is the treaty, the treaty drafting and negotiation process and how states react um, uh, or how could states react when they're faced with this with the silence. Um, so perhaps we start with you, Natalie, this time. Oh, thanks very much, Neha. I think in terms of how states have reacted, we have the same, a very similar reflection of the spectrum between not doing anything at all, so silence, um, or uh, responding in the way it, that treaties have been drafted. So uh, I think generally, which, whichever end of the spectrum uh, we see states lie, um, states are aware of the importance of careful drafting. And um, but the how this plays out is often determined by context, which is a word that in one way or another has come up uh, in everybody's interventions up until this point. Um, and the, the they're very different aspects to uh, context and we've had we've heard a little bit about how it could be um, the the subject matter that we're talking about so are we talking about boundary delimitations are we talking about um, investment uh, treaty obligations it was and in my case I talked about different types of treaties, a bilateral treaty, plurilateral, multilateral. There's also the idea of rights or remedies involved, which is something that came through, I think, Simon's intervention as well. Um, and, and all these, I think, uh, draw uh, different types of reactions from states in the, in the drafting approach. Um, there is a consciousness, I think, that when you're when you're drafting a more detailed, uh, specific treaty, that you have to be very careful to be to be to fully elucidate everything that you mean and enumerate it in the treaty text, recognizing the general trend that silence could mean an omission uh, with meaning because you've been so detailed, you must have left something out on purpose. Um, other treaties, when we draft them, like where they are constitutions or living trees that set up 
are broad principles. Uh, the intention is to have them apply to a range of circumstances. So you draft them in a, in a very different way. So I would imagine that's what went through the minds of uh, the negotiators of the UN Convention Law of the Sea, which has since been upheld, upheld as a constitution for the oceans, human rights treaties like the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and for, for, such, for such treaties, one could perhaps say that just because a treaty or a provision doesn't expressly address an issue does not mean that the issue is not substantively addressed. Um, there is also uh, in, in drafting a treaty, a consciousness that silence can be read within the body of a particular text, uh, as well as read across different treaties of the same family. Um, and this is something that we see in individual treaty practice of, of states uh, when, we, when we prepare our free trade agreements, investment treaty agreements, for example, where you may have a series that are prepared in the same amount of time and they could be used as comparators across each other. Um, but we've also seen this come up uh, just to, to draw in another area of, of, of international law in the jurisprudence of the World Trade Organization, where there's been a differential treatment between silence read within the same treaty. So for example, Japan, the alcoholic beverages case, uh, sorry, the appellate body in the Japan alcoholic beverages case, um, comparing different aspects of Article 3 of GATT uh, and, and drawing meaning from the silence of, or rather the omission of certain words and a silence across treaties. So in the U.S. anti-dumping and countervailing duties case, um, there was reference to the predecessor agreement to the SCM agreement, uh, the, the uh, subsidies and countervailing measures agreement, the Tokyo Round Subsidies Code, and whether or not to, to um, draw certain uh, intentions of, of the, of the members of the WTO by the fact that the subsequent SCM agreement did not contain uh, a provision that had been reflected in the Tokyo Round Subsidies Code. And the answer there was, in that case, was no. Um, in terms of investment treaties, what we've seen is very much in response to the developments in jurisprudence, they have become um, a lot more detailed and a lot more prescriptive over time, both in their address of issues of both process and substance. We, for example, see in more recent investment treaties the not uncommon usage of for greater certainty language, which I think all of us here would be familiar with where clarifications in newer treaties are made with the intent of having them apply to, to the older treaties as well. More detailed language or annexures, uh, clarifying concepts such as fair and equitable treatment for protection security and this anecdotal observation um, I noted has actually been borne out by a survey in 2015 by the OECD Secretariat, and they looked at a, a series of before and after pairs of treaties, um, where an earlier treaty was replaced by a renegotiated treaty, and they found that it, it was it is true that these negotiated renegotiated treaties were generally longer and more detailed, um, and also featured more similarities. There was a convergence in the, in the, mode, of, in the mode and style of drafting in the use of language, um, especially on, on the more contentious provisions that have, have drawn the attention of arbitral tribunals, such as FET, a fair and equitable treatment, um, and, and, and the associated concepts. At the same time, though, um, I thought it was use, it'd be useful to just add that it would be unrealistic still to place the burden on states to constantly react to fix the excesses of jurisprudence to their treaties or agreements, even assuming that there is such anything that needs to be fixed. Um, speaking as the silence pragmatist uh, that, that you have uh, uh, put, put me in the bucket of, which I don't disagree with, uh, treaty negotiations, they take time. States have capacity issues. You may not always have the ability to take up a negotiation or a renegotiation that you have every intention to do. Even if you do, your treaty partner may want to clarify the jurisprudence in a different way. When you get round to it, you may not have the same idea of how to do so when you get when you draft the clarification that you seek to do. And this causes the complications that I referred to above about comparisons across different texts um, that are prepared over the same period. And more broadly, treaties are drafted to promote stability, to promote 
predictability. And if the idea is to put the burden on states to react through the renegotiation of treaties constantly, then there is an element, uh, going back to this broader theme of stability and change that Campbell first referred to, uh, of shifting that, that emphasis onto change at the expense of stability. Um, I did want to talk about issues of travel in all of this, but I think I've taken up enough time already. I'd be happy to maybe revisit this, this point later on in my comments. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's fascinating. And let's try and come back to the travel point in, um, in the Q&A perhaps also, because, because it would definitely be an interesting area to explore as part of this whole uh, rubric of, of silence. But, but given where you left off, um, you know, and then with the focus on arbitration, I'm going to have to turn to you, Simon, again, like, you know, and on whether your experience in arbitration matches up with what, you know, Natalie just outlined about states not uh, not necessarily always wanting to fill up the silence, notwithstanding the increasing use of boilerplate um, in investment treaties, um, but also not having the capacity, even if they do want to fill in the silence, um, and then their efforts might be ineffectual, even, even if they do have the willingness and the capacity. Um, so I was wondering what your experience in arbitration is, um, given what Natalie has just said. Right, and, and my experience, to the <laughs> short answer is that my experience uh, really matches exactly what uh, Natalie is saying in terms of the practical considerations that go into um, doing uh, these kinds of filling in of the silence uh, process. But maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back a bit and say that, um, that, that states, in fact, um, are often encouraged by various stakeholders in the system to fill in areas of silence. With, with express language. And you see that from various communities. In fact, everybody seems to be saying that, you know, if you're not happy with the way in which the arbitrators have interpreted the treaty, it's easy. Just fix the treaty. That's the easy solution. And, you know, states are being told that by, you know, well-meaning like NGOs telling them you should fix that, you should adopt the joint interpretation, should amend the treaty. There's very, various ways in which you can clarify your intent. They're also being told that by the claimant community saying, well, you know, if you're not happy, fix it. You know, so they're being told, they're being told that by the international organizations. And Natalie mentioned the uh, OECD. Um, there's a, there are a lot of discussions there uh, about, you know, how to fix treaties, how to improve, et cetera, how to clarify. Um, so, uh, you know, and <laughs> Natalie mentioned these, uh, this interesting practice of for greater certainty. Another one is for the avoidance of doubt um, to indicate that this is simply a clarification of what the state's intent was all along. Um, so, of course, filling in the gaps is an important way or technique for limiting arbitral discretion in interpreting treaties. But focusing exclusively on this avenue may be inadequate um, for um, at least three reasons, in addition to the reasons that Natalie mentioned, which are more on the practical side of things. Um, I would say first, it's not possible to predict all potential creative interpretations that litigants or arbitrators may adopt. There will always be perceived areas or arguable areas of silence on certain issues. Even when faced with express restrictions, arbitrators have read in some cases areas of silence into the treaties, like in the Eco Oro v. Colombia case I mentioned. Second, claimants sometimes point to restrictive provisions in new treaties as support for the view that older treaties do not contain such restrictions. And I think maybe Natalie touched upon this a bit. You compare different treaties of the same kind in the realm of a particular field of law, and you say, well, you see, this was done this way. There is this model available. You know why? You know we should interpret the. Um, you know maybe maybe Natalie was mentioning it. You were mentioning it more um, in the reverse sequence in time. I'm I'm speaking about new treaties being interpreted as as saying, especially by claimants saying, you see, it's easy to come up with language to address this issue. You know, it's easy. You can do it as shown by these new treaties. So, but you know. That's not our question here. We have a treaty of more of an older generation treaty that does not have uh, this kind of specificity. So why should we interpret the two treaties in the same way? You know, you, there's a lot of, there are a lot of fights going on with these kinds of arguments in actual arbitration. The third point I wanted to mention is that it's a pretty obvious point, but filling in the gaps 
revealed by arbitral interpretations, by definition, comes too late. It's useful to preclude certain interpretations for future disputes by adding new language, but at that point, the damage has already been done with potentially huge consequences for the state. So this shows that filling in the gaps reactively, so to say, in the face of creative interpretations is not a perfect solution, in addition to it not being very practical, as Natalie mentioned. So there are other reform proposals in international investment law that focus more on the adjudicators. Maybe, <laughs> again, Natalie can mention that she's very much involved in that process, uh, Campbell also. Um, the most debated proposal, which is currently being discussed at UNCITRO, is the replacement of the system of arbitration with an investment court with judges and an appeals mechanism. I think this may be a, a useful avenue in improving the quality of legal reasoning. I mean, appeals mechanism, that's, that's the goal pursued by an appeals mechanism. And, and but potentially cutting back on um, arguable excesses uh, in, in arbitrations. Um, but unfortunately, I have to say, this reform process does not involve this, the substantive obligations in treaties. So even if the reform succeeds, there's a risk that the new system will end up entrenching, at least to some extent, the expensive body of law created under the old regime. I'm not sure what an ideal solution would be, but surely it cannot focus on just one aspect or the other. Um, you need to think about adjudicators as well as substantive treaty terms in tandem, in my view. Thank you. Since you did point to uh, to Campbell, he won. Um, you know, maybe maybe Campbell will will come up with the ideal solution that you, that you were just uh, that you were just outlining. I but wouldn't doubt uh, it. Yeah, don't want to put you on the spot, Campbell. So you you're happy to 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 talk about the ideal solution, but also more generally on you know on what how do you think states should be reacting or you know to this to the silence that seems to be so ubiquitous, and what role what role should they be assuming in this process? I'll try and come back to uh, Simon's last point about the reform in this little area of investment law, which in which he and I and Natalie, are, well, all of us on the panel have had some uh, considerable experience in my remark at the end of my remarks. But just to say, uh, just looking at the point more generally, why 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 should we attach normative significance to silence? I think you know essentially the international legal system assumes. And I think rightly that states are, as it were, sentient actors in the system. In other words, going along with the undoubted power which states have by virtue of being states comes a set of responsibilities. And part of those responsibilities is to engage in the system, in the elaboration of the system as it goes forward, in particular where the particular interests, specific interests of the individual states uh, engaged. So, you know, I very much subscribe to the overall um, uh, picture that Danai uh, presents that uh, this is part of a larger process in which claims are constantly made by states. And then other states, particularly those states that are specifically affected, have uh, the, the duty either to protest if they say, no, this is an illegitimate claim. Uh, it's not found in international law, we disagree, uh, or to acquiesce. And uh, acquiescence, which is the, you know, the legal name more commonly given to, to silence, at least in, the, in uh, the, the consequences where real normative um, uh, consequences are attached, doesn't come cheap because it reposits the idea that this that the state has been placed in a position where it really must respond one way or another and in failing to respond it's it's going to know that certain consequences will will uh, attach to that because it's an implied recognition that the claim made by the other state is is a valid claim um now how do we then translate this across into the context of uh, active um, normative engagement through treaty uh, on which uh, Natalie has spoken uh, with uh, much wisdom and insight. I would say from my own experience also um, in treaty negotiation, um, 
very often treaties say what they say in part because saying more could not be agreed between the states and could not have been agreed between the states. In other words, often treaties represent a kind of a, I don't know whether it's a golden minimum, but certainly a, a minimum around which consensus could be achieved and to say more uh, would have been uh, dangerous and um, ill-advised. Um, and I mean, both, uh, and Natalie makes the point, and Simon also in particular in his uh, very interesting larger draft paper, that states operate on the basis that, well, what fills the gap is public international law more generally, and in particular, uh, custom international law and general principles. And that's right. I mean, you couldn't negotiate a treaty, except a treaty is, would be just a piece of paper if there were no international legal system that closed it with legal effect. But of course, what this does is beg the question, which arises really in the context of every treaty uh, that's concluded, which is, well, to what extent is it uh, merely or uh, assuming on any given issue the continuance of customary international law? And to what extent is it intending to reform or change that law? If, if, if treaties did no more than merely recognize the position that previously existed, they'd form no uh, use, perform no useful function. So I think the, the point is that um, there's a constant tension, I think, in international law between stability and change, and in this context, between the curative function of treaties as well as the function of observing, um, confirming uh, 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 the law around them that continues to apply. And often for that reason, states use, if you like, mobile terms, which can evolve over time deliberately. And that's where I think there's a role uh, for, still a role for protest or acquiescence in the development of treaties, which was the why, hence the example that I gave in my opening remarks. So both Natalie and Simon have pointed to this uh, practice, which is quite common now in free trade agreements, of trying to get more and more specific and um, I'm not obviously opposed as I fully understand all the pressures that uh, are, are driving it, uh, but I very much like a, a, a remark made by Baroness O'Neill in her um, ASA lecture uh, in 2017, where she said, you know, in a lot of contexts, the pressure is always for more law. We think we can solve all of our problems if we just write more and more detailed descriptions. And free trade agreements are a kind of an extreme example of this. I mean, they, now they, they rarely come in at under a thousand pages uh, and uh, with many, many footnotes and side letters and the like. Um, but of course, this, uh, more law in itself is never going to save us. What, what, what the, the whole international legal system operates on some rather more fundamental concepts of trust and, and good faith. And, and unless those um, concepts are held to by tribunals as well as by states and other participants, the whole thing will just be a house of cards which will eventually uh, collapse as uh, uh, Arnold Toynbee so famously said in a losing battle with the ungovernable forces of destruction. So we do need, I think, in all of this to focus on uh, what really are the important goals that we're trying to maintain in operating uh, the system as a whole. And in the, in the context of in the, in the investment law debate, I completely agree with Simon, you know, the, 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 in this sense, that I think the debate about um, procedural mechanisms is important. And indeed, I've tried to make my own contribution to that through the uh, new Institute of International Law Equality uh, principles. Um, that is, it's important, but it's, it's tending to crowd out a much more important debate that we should be having in that field, at least about well, what do we actually say are the substantive principles that we want uh, in a positive sense for investment law, rather than just assuming that they're all cast in stone tablets and that all we can do is chip away at them with more and more footnotes and free trade agreements. Thanks very much. Yes, rather than more law, if we could have better law, then that would, that would be you know, perhaps a better way to go. I think so. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, but you started the answer with, with this interesting observation, which sounded like sort of a summary of Peter Parker, you know, with, with great power comes great responsibility as far as, as far as states are concerned. 
Um, but you know, but so this sort of I want to turn to Dene now, I think perhaps for the for the last response, um, because states, of course, again, are not not the only actors, perhaps not even the most important actors in some ways in international law. International law itself is being transformed, um, like around the whole rubric of, of silence. You have non-state actors on the rise, you have all kinds of codes of conduct, you have um, so states are no longer in the driving seat, or at least not always in the driving seat, especially depending on which regime of international law is being implicated. So, so I was wondering if you could reflect on the larger sort of reaction that you think state silence should invite, given the fact that states are not always the central actors. Thank you, Neha. Um, so, I, so I'm taking everyone back to um, state silence again, um, the meaning of um, state silence. So in my view, state silence uh, is given legal meaning owing to its context. Um, and also, I think we need to also reflect a little bit on the uh, qualifications um, under which uh, state silence can be given um, legal effect. So a state has to be in a position to react and the circumstances called for some reaction. And being in a position to react also includes um, having uh, knowledge of the circumstances that call for your reaction. And these requirements uh, have been very usefully set out uh, by the International Law Commission also in its um, work on um, identification of custom um, 2018 in its conclusions, but also in, it, in its um, 2018 conclusions on subsequent agreements and practice in relation to treatment interpretation. But, of course, they are abstract and context dependent. Um, and I think that brings me to um, one, my, my major perhaps um, um, thesis here that we cannot possibly understand the legal meaning of state silence and the conditions under which it can be given legal significance without reflecting on the major transformations that have taken place in international law in the 20th and 21st century. Now, first, today we have more than 190 states, and all those states are equal under international law. In re reality, their political, economic, and institutional capacities differ considerably. Second, technological advancements have made communications significantly easier and more numerous. So legal claims by states may become public through almost instantaneous means of communication. And publicity may arise in the context of institutions from states, of course, through traditional diplomatic notes, but also today through the websites of ministries of foreign affairs, and also by private actors through um, mass or social media. So these new methods of publicity raise a question about what is the threshold of knowledge and the underlying threshold of publicity in order for state silence to be taken as acceptance in the lawmaking process. Third, old international law was primarily based on a matrix on, of bilateral relationships between states. And in this exclusively interstate and bilateral setting, acquiescence has found a very natural place. And the examples of Prekh Bihar and even Somalia, Kenya that I discussed earlier demonstrate the modern relevance of acquiescence in relation to boundary delimitation. But modern international law is much more diverse Alongside bilateral obligations, we have hierarchically superior norms, use Kogan's norms, such as the prohibition of genocide and of torture. And the international legal order protects community interests through erga omnes and erga omnes partis obligations, such as protecting human rights and, and the environment. So the question that arises here is whether um, state silence has the same legal effects and significance given the shift from bilateralism to community interests in international law. And for one thing, International Law Commission in its current work on use tokens, it has been adopted in fact on first reading, does not mention silence. And I don't think that this should be taken as a coincidence. Um, the conclusions on use tokens have been prepared in parallel with the conditions on identification of custom and the conclusions on um, subsequent agreements and practice in relation to treaty interpretation. And both of these other conclusions include um, a provision on failure to react or on silence. So the question arises whether the, the International Law Commission today considers that state silence does not play the same role within Euskogen's identification. Uh, fourth, um, 
state silence becomes legally, legally relevant in relation to a context or a claim and presupposes knowledge. So modern international law encompasses fields where institutional structures such as intergovernmental organizations and conferences of parties or assemblies of parties uh, provide a permanent form of communication between states. Some examples are in the environmental law field, the World Health Organization, but even the ICC's Assembly of States Parties. And the question here is whether um, such institutional formations provide an increased or a decreased role for state silence as acceptance or even as, as opposition. And fifth, traditionally acquiescence in international law has been conceived in a bilateral interstate setting. A state acts, another state does not act. The lack of that reaction can be taken as acceptance. But in modern international law, non-state actors, um, and especially international courts and tribunals and expert treaty bodies have proliferated, and they are claiming a place in the international lawmaking process. Now, some of these bodies have actively claimed that the silence of states vis-a-vis -vis their own pronouncements entails the uh, acceptance, the acquiescence of states. An example is the Human Rights Committee, uh, for instance, uh, which has claimed that the silence of ICCPR parties towards the pronouncements of the Human Rights Committee means that the states' parties acquiesce to the interpretations of the ICCPR by the committee. This has been fervently opposed by the United States and the United, United Kingdom. Australia and New Zealand have responded um, by taking a more nuanced approach, but without opposing to the idea that acquiescence could take place in a setting that is not strictly interstate. But I think um, this incident, let's put it this way, raises the question about whether the scope of application of acquiescence has now been, or perhaps should be extended to include also claims by um, non-state actors. And these are some of the, the questions and queries I think that um, um, I, I believe um, should be asked in, in the context of uh, a modern debate about state silence and they form part of my ongoing work. So I encourage also colleagues to in the audience to stay tuned. And I very much look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you, Danae. And I see the audience is very much staying tuned and if, if, the chat, if the chat function is anything to go by. I'm going to first briefly before turning, turning to the audience and we have about 10 minutes for, for the questions. I'm going to briefly um, share my screen for those of you who are uh, interested in and who have registered for CLE credits. So as, those, as some of you know, this, um, this panel has been approved for CLE credits, but you do need a code which is on the CLE um, which is on the affirmation page. So you will need to use um, this code. Um, and unfortunately the code will not be shared post, post this panel. So for those of you who are registered, please, please note the code number um, and you can find the affirmation form on, uh, on the landing page of, of the website um, of the International Weekend website as well. And the form has to be mailed back um, by the 12th of November. I'm going to now stop sharing. We go to the question. So as I said, we have about 10 minutes. So what I, what I propose to do is actually pick up um, two of the questions that actually throw up, um, throw up a number of issues um, because they're, they're worded in such a way that they, they go off into all sorts of areas of international law and maybe then have, um, have the panelists respond um, to, to either or both of those questions as you please, um, just in order, um, the order in which we started. So, so Campbell, then, um, then Natalie, Dane, and Simon. Um, so I'm just gonna read out those two questions and please feel free to respond to, to both or, or to either. Um, so one of the questions is about reservations, which is in your view, how should silence be interpreted with, res with respect to reservations? Would your answer differ as far as estoppel is concerned? Um, and the second question is about, um, it's quite a philosophical question on what role does time play in the diverse meanings of silence? Does silence have to be prolonged to produce legal consequences? And one of the examples given is um, that of an insurgency group that happens to take up the government of a country. And can the state silence be construed as a recognition of the group as the effective government, um, as an example? 
Um, so I will then start with, um, as I said, Campbell, um, Natalie, Danae, and then Simon um, to, to respond to either or, or both of those questions, um, Campbell. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's quite wonderful, actually, that uh, our audience is uh, in their fertile minds picking up some of the areas which we're all conscious of in planning this session where silence can produce real legal effects, but which uh, for pressure of time we, we weren't able to, to cover because, of course, <clears throat> the uh, reservations uh, regime, you can call it that, in the Vienna Convention and particularly the uh, uh, opposability um, uh, elements in that is a, is a very clear manifestation of a context and a new context comparatively, just picking up on Danae's point about the move from bilateralism into um, a multilateral context in which um, international law expects states, if they wish to oppose, to stand up and say so. Uh, and otherwise assumes uh, the validity of reservations. But I think the recognition of government's example is also a very interesting one, um, because uh, in my own research on this, I think, um, and it's, it, generalizations in, in this field can be dangerous, and I'm, I'm conscious that the whole field of recognition is itself a very contentious one on which international lawyers tend to take strong views. But my own observation is that we have we uh, have moved progressively from a uh, situation in which, uh, in relation to governments, and here I'm talking about governments rather than states, uh, from in which recognition, an active statement by another state, was regarded as an essential element uh, in the validity of a new government, to a situation where. Uh, uh, government is really tested on the underlying facts in terms of e effectivity, uh, rather than on the basis of active uh, statements. And there are some sound diplomatic reasons uh, for that in most cases, um, although we also know, because there have been some celebrated recent examples where states have chosen uh, to expressly uh, recognize or not to recognize. But this is another example of where I think we've moved from a situation where uh, the presumption is that there has to be an, uh, an express statement to, uh, to one where uh, we judge the significance of a particular state of affairs on the basis of the factual evidence. Thanks, Neha. That's great. Um, Natalie? Thanks very much, Neha. Um, I had considered the issue of silence on reservations, and uh, as you all know, after our preliminary discussions decided, um, it was it's got to, it's, it it would probably take an entire panel on itself. So I probably won't uh, comment on that so much. But um, but yeah, there are definitely different schools of thought on on how um, uh, silence uh, would play into the acceptance or not of reservations. Uh, also, in fact, I suppose just very briefly to say whether or not reservations are allowed. Um, where the treaty does not does not state it, and of course we've got the ICJ advisory opinion um, of the, on the genocide convention that that would go to that. Um, the the questions of uh, estoppel and acquiescence, I think uh, Dane has really provided us that that framework of how to think about the issues. Um, and one of the key aspects to it uh, is not acquiescence does presume knowledge. So whilst we talk about um, the impact of time on, on whether or not acquiescence can, can translate into something that a little bit more legally significant, uh, I think it has to be understood within the context of other factors, such as whether or not the requisite knowledge, for instance, would vest. Um, the other uh, notion here is, um, I think it has also been explored by the WTO, and I think it was in the Guatemala cement case, as to whether or not if you do not 
um, oppose certain notifications, then are you then precluded from uh, raising the issue in the context of subsequent dispute settlement proceedings? And this illustrates that the concept of time also needs to be interpreted and understood within the rubric of the applicable treaty regime. So in that case, uh, the reference to the WTO dispute settlement understanding um, and the procedures that were triggered therein were referred to as, as important aspects as to whether or not uh, Mexico had been, it was, was subsequently stopped from raising certain arguments in their challenge of uh, measures that were, were put in place by, by Guatemala that were central to that case. So I think those are the main points that I would highlight in relation to time and rather the context that influence uh, the relevance and of, of time. Um, and maybe just a, a side point on recognition of governments, I, I very much agree with what Campbell has mentioned. Um, there is there is the idea that you can impliedly recognize a government, uh, but this does not necessarily translate into silence being uh, uh, um, having meaning uh, in terms of recognition of governments in the way that we would understand to have a proactive and positive uh, meaning. Thank you. Thank you, Dene. Um, thank you very much. So in terms of recognition of governments, um, I think Campbell and I agree, uh, although I would phrase this a little bit different in the sense that I don't think that there is in international law today um, an expectation um, that states recognize um, uh, governments. Uh, and as a result, uh, the, the lack of um, so the silence in that context um, well, um, does not entail um, a recognition of a government. Um, in relation to reservations, uh, again, Campbell and I immediately are thinking exactly the same thing, which is the, the issue of accepting uh, a reservation. I, and I think that's a very interesting example of where uh, time comes in, because the, the Vienna Convention very specifically indicates 12 months from, um, from when a um, um, a state has been notified of uh, the reservation. If a state has not objected to the reservation by the end of that period of 12 months, then it is presumed to have accepted it. Um, and I think this again raises the point that um, of stability in relations. What the drafters had in mind is that um, by um, creating this um, uh, presumption that at 12 months, if you have not objected, you have accepted, uh, meant to uh, ensure that the relationships between parties become uh, clear. Um, what, and, and, and this is an example of uh, time being relevant, but a very short period of time being relevant, by the way, because indeed, Time is a, a requirement um, in international law um, for um, silence to have a legal effect of acceptance, for instance, in cast um, opinion of, as opinion juris or for the purpose of acquiescence as such. But um, we can see that, especially in the ICJ case law, we're talking whenever the court has really considered um, silence to have that legal effect, we're talking about silence of 30 years, 50 years. Um, in the Somali tennis, Kenya case, for instance, that the court took into account that within four years, Somalia had reacted to, um, to uh, some proclamations by Kenya. So it didn't consider the four years silence as uh, sufficient for, for it to prove acceptance um, of, of you know, a tacit agreement or acquiescence that the court, court has, has indicated. Um, and in terms of uh, the acquiescence and, and estoppel, I'm not so sure, uh, Neha, if you ans asked that, but I think Natalie made a comment and I can see a question in the, should that, is it okay if I take um, a respond? I just don't want to uh, dominate the debate. I just wanted to point out that these two concepts are very different. Um, the, uh, in terms of the requirements that they have, but also their um, rationale. Uh, while acquiescence is about consent, it, you are proving consent here, tacitly conveyed. Estoppel has nothing to do with consent. You don't have to prove consent. The only thing that is relevant is good faith and the legitimate expectations of the other party. And that connects a little bit with Campbell about uh, the, the points that he made on the, what are the reasons for which silence can be given legal relevance. The classic is voluntar voluntarism, uh, consensualism in international law that takes us also to the Lotus case. And I hope that I'm responding to that as well a little bit. Um, 
The second reason can be good, a good faith and legitimate expectations of everyone else. And the third indeed is if you're free and powerful, you have to at the same time have some responsibility, which is this legislative responsibility, uh, if, if I can call it that way. Uh, thank you. That's great, thank you. And I'm afraid we're actually out of time because um, because we've all been, you know, it's been such a rich discussion that, you know, that and we can have a different panel on all these aspects, actually, and as Natalie said, uh, including on reservations itself. But thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Thank you very much to all our panelists for, for providing so much food for thought. Um, and I hope everyone has um, has a good afternoon or, or a good evening or can finally go to sleep, Natalie. Um, and, uh, and enjoy the rest of the International Law Weekend. Um, thank you again, everyone.